Now that we know about types of compounds and the bonds that hold them together, we can start to talk about how we use these compounds, so what we do with them in the lab, how we measure them, things like that. So this week's lecture is going to have two main parts. Uh, the first one is basically math, so we'll do that in class. In the second part, we're going to start talking about reactions. So that's what we're going to start covering here. There are four main types of chemical reactions. Um, they're all, all four, they're very different from each other. They're pretty easy to tell apart from each other. For here, we'll, we'll very quickly go through the four types. For each of the four types, which are listed here, and we'll go through them one by one, there's going to be showing you examples by rearranging these atoms here. So here is A and B. Those are single atoms off by themselves. And then C, D is a compound made of C and D, and E and F is another compound. So we'll use these as our starting reactants in our reaction. First type of reaction is a decomposition. This is about as simple as you can get. Here we're starting with a compound that has more than one element. It starts as something complicated and it falls apart in the things that are less complicated. Key here, if, if there's one reactant, it's a decomposition. There's nothing else it can do except fall apart. In our reactions, the reactants are always on the left. We say the reactants yield, this is a yield arrow our products and our products are on the right. So decomposition has one reactant and more than one product. This is another example of a decomposition reaction. This is mercury oxide which is a compound. It's breaking down into mercury and oxygen. So in this picture this is mercury oxide in a test tube. This is what it looks like on the atomic scale. We break it down and we get mercury metal, which is this silver liquid in the bottom of the test tube here, and then oxygen gas, which of course you can't see oxygen gas, so it escaped up the test tube. Here's the mercury, here's our oxygen. Decomposition is just something falling apart. So let's practice predicting what things are going to fall, fall apart into. So here we have a reaction of platinum-4 chloride decomposing into elements, it says. Here's platinum-4 chloride, the solid. It says we heat it up, and it's going to yield something else. What does it yield? Think about in your head, what can this break apart into? It says it decomposes to its elements. So what are the elements in platinum-4 chloride? We have platinum, and we have chlorine. So what's that going to look like over here? Well, platinum, the metal, is just going to be platinum. Chlorine, by itself, is a gas. But remember, it's diatomic. So it's going to be Cl2, not just Cl. So here is our platinum solid. And here is our Cl2. The opposite of decomposition is synthesis, or combination. This is, again, very simple. In this case, we have multiple reactants, one product. If you just have one product, it has to be a synthesis or a combination reaction. Synthesis, combination, just two names for the same thing. So here we have A and B coming together to yield AB. Zinc, chlorine come together to yield zinc chloride. But it's not always just a, B. You don't have to take two elements on their own to make a compound. You can take an element and a compound to make a bigger compound. So A plus C, D gives us A, C, D. Where hydrogen plus carbon monoxide gives us H2, C, O. We can also take two compounds, combine them together to get one giant compound. Thing notice on all of them is the one compound in, in the products. If it's one product, it has to be a synthesis reaction. There's nothing else it can be. So here's another example 
carbon monoxide and oxygen coming together to make CO2. The atomic scale, we have carbon monoxide and oxygen. That's going to combine with that to get that. But you can probably see what's going on. One of these oxygen atoms is going to go there. One of the other one is going to go there. And we're going to get two carbon dioxides. Generally, in these types of reactions, you have a metal reacting with a non-metal to make an ionic compound, like sodium reacting with chlorine to make sodium chloride. It's also possible, though, that a non-metal may re react with another non-metal. And if that happens, you're going to get a molecular compound, because there's no metal involved, so it has to be a molecular compound. And like we saw, you can also combine two compounds together. So let's predict this. So here we have aluminum plus bromine, and we know it's a synthesis reaction. I'm telling you that. Okay. So what's it going to make? It's going to make an ionic compound, so it's going to make aluminum bromide. So what is the formula for aluminum bromide? Aluminum bromide and AlBr3. The next type of reaction is a little more complicated. This one is single displacement. So in this case, we have A as an element, and we have a compound CD. Instead of adding on, A is going to replace C. It's going to come in, kick out C, and it's going to form a compound with D. So now we have AD and C is now an element on its own. So zinc plus copper chloride is going to give us zinc chloride and copper. The zinc kicked out the copper, and the copper is now off on its own. So you may be wondering why did the zinc kick out the copper? I mean, who's to say that zinc is more important than copper? There actually is a reason, and you'll see that on a later slide. So, in a single displacement, we always have an element. It's usually going to be a metal that is uh, it's going to displace another metal that's already in a compound. You're going to see this a number of times in lab. So, in this picture, we have a copper wire. And then in solution, we have silver nitrate. So we have copper solid, silver nitrate in solution. The copper is going to replace silver to give us silver metal and copper nitrate. So in the picture, we can see this is silver forming on the outside of the copper wire. And we don't have a picture here, but this solution started clear. Blue solutions, you'll see, you'll see this in lab, generally mean there's copper. There's not copper in the solution. So here's some other examples. Aluminum, where we place iron in iron oxide to make aluminum oxide and give us iron. This is used in making metals that that our cars and things are made out of. Also, iron will replace copper, copper oxide, to make iron oxide and copper. So, this question here asks us to look at the charge on the metal. What happens to that charge when it displaces the other metal? So here we have aluminum. What's the charge on aluminum? In this case, it's zero. So, it's zero over here. What's the charge on the aluminum? It's an aluminum ion now, so it's plus three. So it went from zero to plus three. Here, iron is zero. Here, iron is plus two. So it went from zero to plus. So the metal that's doing the displacing is going from zero to a, to a positive number. That's not really a, an important idea. But it, I think it can help you to 
kind of get a hold of what's going on here. So well, let's look at some pictures. So here is copper. And then in the solution is a silver solution. Okay. So, and then over here in this beaker, we have a silver metal and a copper solution. We let them sit. And then we see the copper metal now has this black on it. And the silver metal looks exactly like it did. So which one displaced something? Copper displaced the silver. It kicked the silver out of solution. The silver had no place else to go. It formed this black substance on the copper. We say that copper is more active. And we'll come back to that. Just remember that term. The final type of reaction is double displacement. This one is actually, in my mind, a little bit simpler. So in this case, we have two solutions, and they're both made of compounds dissolved in water. In this case, it's silver nitrate and potassium chloride, and they switch partners. C is now with F. E is now with D. They just switched partners. So we now have silver chloride, potassium nitrate. And then we're going to figure out later on why is this one solid now, whereas this is aqueous and well, everything we had here is aqueous. Double displacement is just switching partners. So we have four types of reactions. Decomposition, one reactant makes multiple products. Combination, or multiple reactants make one product. And single displacement, double displacement. If you look at the reactants, you can easily tell these apart. Double displacement has two compounds. Single replacement has one compound and an element. So based on the single replacement reactions we've looked at, we can tell, we've already saw, that copper is more active than silver, iron is more active than copper, and aluminum is more active than iron. But we shouldn't have to actually try something to figure it out. There must be a way to predict that. And there is. We can use what we call an activity series. And this tells us which ones are more active than others. So this is our activity series. All we do is we find the two elements that we care about on the list. Whichever one is higher is more active. It will displace something that is lower. So will magnesium displace hydrogen? So we find magnesium. There is magnesium. And there is hydrogen. Magnesium is higher, so magnesium will displace hydrogen. If we take magnesium metal, solid, add it to hydrochloric acid, it will kick out the hydrogen. We make magnesium chloride, and then we have hydrogen all on its own thing that has the higher activity, the one that's higher up, wants to be in a compound. It is the stronger element. It will push the other one out of the way to get into the compound. So will aluminum displace hydrogen? There's aluminum, there's hydrogen. Yes, aluminum will displace hydrogen. Will iron displace zinc? Iron is there. Here's iron. And zinc is up here. So zinc is higher. Iron will not displace zinc. If you had a reaction like that and was asking what the products were, you would simply say there is no reaction. So here's an example of using the activity series to write out a reaction. So it says we have calcium metal, it's calcium solid. It's going to react with zinc bromide. The first step is to figure out if a reaction does happen, what's going to replace what. Calcium is our lone element, so it's going to try to displace the zinc, which is a metal in the compound. Calcium is here, zinc is here. Calcium is higher, because it's stronger, it will kick out the zinc to make a compound. So if we write out 
our formula, we're going to have calcium. It's going to react with zinc bromide to yield zinc on its own plus calcium bromide. So the calcium kicked out the zinc, they basically just stitched, switched places. So how do we predict double displacement reactions? In this case it's not a matter of using an activity series, but it's not really all that more difficult. Remember in a double displacement reaction we have two compounds that are going to switch partners. Usually in a double displacement reaction, one of the products is not soluble in water. Both of the reactants have to be soluble in water. If they're not dissolved, they can't switch partners. So how can we predict which one is going to be a solid? If there is a solid, it's going to be a precipitation reaction. But in very rare cases, you can also get gas formation. In both cases, we're making something that's not soluble. We're either going to make a precipitate, which is a solid that's going to come out of solution and fall to the bottom of the beaker, or you're going to make a gas that's going to bubble out of solution. In either case, it's going to leave the solution. So this is a precipitation reaction. In a precipitation reaction, take your, re your reactants, switch to partners, figure out which product is insoluble. So in this case, we're taking barium chloride, dissolved in water, mixing it with sodium sulfate, dissolved in water. We make barium sulfate and sodium chloride. When we do that, we're pouring a clear liquid into a clear liquid and getting a white solid. So what is that white solid? That's our barium sulfate solid that formed. Here's another way of looking at it, if we look at it on the molecular scale. So this is our sodium sulfate, our barium chloride, and they're in different containers, they're in different beakers. We mix them, and now we have a mixture. But when one of these sulfates comes in contact with a barium, it makes barium sulfate, which is not soluble in water, it won't dissolve in water, so it comes out of solution and falls to the bottom. So we can tell whether something is soluble or insoluble without actually doing it. There are solubility charts, solubility tables. In your book, it's page 308, and you can find them everywhere. The search solubility table online, and you'll find a lot of examples. This is one example. So this is how we use it. On the left, we have soluble ions. On the right, we have insoluble ions. And then there's exceptions. So if we have a compound that has sodium in it, no matter what is with the sodium, it's soluble. Anything with potassium, ammonium, nitrate, or an acetate, it is soluble always. If you have a chloride, a bromide, or an iodide, it is always soluble unless it is with silver, mercury, or lead. Sulfate, silver, calcium, it's always soluble unless it is with barium, strontium, or lead. And this one goes the opposite direction. Carbonates, phosphates, hydroxides, and sulfides are always insoluble unless they are either with ammonium 
or a group one metal. Now, you don't have to memorize these. You'll probably do enough of them that you'll have some of them memorized, but you always have access to something like this. This is included on the cheat sheet in class. So you don't need to memorize this. You just need to know how to use it. And you, I would get familiar with the one on the cheat sheet because that's the one you'll have for the final exam. So here is an example. We're going to mix lead nitrate in our graduated cylinder with potassium iodide, which is the clear liquid here. You can see in the picture, when we do that, we're getting a yellow solid. So something is going to happen. But what is that? So we look at our reactants. In our mind, we switch partners. If we switch partners, what do we get? We would get lead with iodine. So let's go back to our chart, and we find something on here that will tell us whether that's soluble. The first thing that pops up to me is here is iodine. It says iodides are soluble unless they are with silver, mercury, or lead. Lead iodide is what we were looking for. So lead iodide is insoluble. So it's looking like our yellow solid is lead iodide. But let's look at the other possibility. That is potassium nitrate. We go back. Potassium is always soluble. Nitrates are always soluble. So potassium nitrate is very, very, very soluble. That's not our, our solid that's forming. So what are our products? We got lead iodide solid and potassium nitrate. But potassium nitrate is soluble, so it's just aqueous. Lead iodide solid potassium nitrate aqueous. So that is uh, a brief overview of the types of reactions. We're going to kind of go over them a little bit more in class on Tuesday um, and we'll, we'll do some more examples. So uh, I hope that's a, a time saver for you. See you in class.